We had asked our question. We said uh, it's an extremely general question, uh, maybe too tough. So how do we know if we're going to be able to solve this question or not? You know, if we are able to solve it, it must be because there's something remarkable going on. And in classical electromagnetism, there is something remarkable going on. There's one property of the theory. And because of that one property, this is why we're able to solve things so explicitly. And that one property of the theory that we use that allows us to make so much progress is called the superposition principle. So, let me tell you what it is, and this is something that we're going to use again and again and again. So, imagine that we start off, and each box here, I'm going to consider three boxes, each box will be a specific situation. So what I will do is, I will put a point charge here, Q1, at position X1, and I will have my particle of charge, Q, at position X. And I will ask, what force does it feel? Now, already from the tapes, we know that like charges will repel each other, and the force will act on the line joining the two charges. So here is the line joining the two, and let's call that F1. So we could go away and make that measurement. We can then consider a second situation in which we have a charge here, Q2, with the position x2, there is charge Q in position x, and this will feel a force. F2. So we make a measurement of F2, we make a measurement of F1, and then we consider a third situation in which we have a charge Q1, position X1, a charge Q2, position X2. So now I've got the charge from this situation and the charge from that situation. And I put in my particle of charge Q in position X. And in this case, I will have some other force acting, F. If you measure F, F1 and F2 very accurately, what you will learn is F is equal to F1 plus F2. So in actual fact, the way the force that particle 2 exerts doesn't depend on whether particle 1 is there or not. And if we had a collection of, say, 20 charges, you could measure the force due to each charge separately, and then if you wanted to get the force due to all 20 charges, you would simply add up those 20 forces that you measured separately. This is extremely useful because it means you can take a problem like this and decompose it into simpler problems, each of which look like this. And once you've understood this simple problem, you've understood the complicated one. That's the idea. This is the interaction between two point charges. And if what I've told you is really true, then whenever we write down solutions to problems, you should be able to see that we are just recycling the point particle answer again and again and again. So you should be able to see, in fact, in electromagnetism, all that we're doing is taking the point particle solution and using it over and over again. I'll try to stress that as we see that happening. The superposition principle is something that was observed in experiment. So it's something that people see when they go into the lab. Does anybody know, is this an exact statement or is it just an approximation? So is this exact? So it's, um, it is an empirical observation. It was measured in the lab. And now the question that I want to ask is, is it an 
exact property of nature. So is it a property of nature, the superposition principle, or is it actually just because we weren't measuring very accurately? Does anyone know the answer? It, not exact. So why do you say it's not exact? What would spoil it? Do you know? So if it's, if it's not exact, there must be some physical effect that's spoiling the superposition principle. Because we make measurements, and in making measurements, there are always room for error. There's always room for error. Okay, that's absolutely true. Okay, so as an experimentalist, you can never measure things with perfect precision. So there's always uh, going to be errors in your measurements. But you know, we, we, we expect that if we keep repeating the measurement and we do it enough times, then we can come to some sort of a statistical statement that we can say, by doing enough experiments, we could say, with the confidence of 99.9999999%, the superposition principle holds. So would we be able to find that? Or, and, and in that case, we would say, wow, this is a property of nature. And there's the normal limitation of the being able to measure things, that we can't do it precisely, and all of that. I accept that. But beyond that limitation, is there some fundamental thing in nature that prevents the superposition principle from being correct? Okay, the answer is again quantum mechanics. In fact, the superposition principle is a fantastically good approximation. It is an excellent approximation. But if you included quantum mechanics in our description, you would find that the superposition principle is not exact. There are small corrections to it. Those corrections are so small, they are so tiny, that they were only recently measured. And they were measured using very high-powered lasers. But in fact, we know, although the superposition principle is a fantastically good approximation, it is not quite exact. For us, we're going to assume it's exact, and that will give us the correct classical theory of electromagnetism. So we'll say, this is a fantastic approximation. But not quite exact. It really is an excellent approximation, but not quite exact. For us, we will assume it's exact. So that's the first thing that we're going to assume, the superposition principle. Um, the next thing that we will assume is the following. So, so we, we're going to call this no back reaction. Um, now what I mean by that is, when we bring this particle when we bring this particle close to these particles these particles don't change they stay exactly as they are okay so that's what we mean by no back reaction this thing we're going to start calling this the source because this is going to be the thing that sets up the electric field and all of that. So it will be the source of the electric field. And this thing we're going to start calling the probe. And we can say something like the source is so robust it is not affected by the probe. This again is not exact, but it is a good approximation. So, so let me discuss this in a situation of gravity, which is more familiar to us. If I let go of this blackboard duster, what will happen? It'll accelerate downwards. With what acceleration? 9,8 meters per second squared. G. Good. So I'll drop it. It will accelerate towards the floor. Is that the only thing that moves? Is it just the duster that goes down? 
What does Newton's third law tell us? <coughs> okay. So if this is attracting the earth, or, or sorry, if the earth is attracting this, then this is also attracting the earth. So it's exerting a force on the earth. So this will accelerate towards the earth, but the earth will also accelerate towards the duster. Right? So it's not just the duster that's moving, right? The earth is also accelerating upwards. <laughs> Does everyone agree with that? Yes. Who says no? <laughs> the earth is very heavy. Okay, so what force is exerted on the duster? Okay, so I, I've got a skill. Okay, I can measure the weights of things just by having them in my hand. This is 250 grams. <laughs> That's the weight of this, 250 grams, quarter of a kilogram. The acceleration is 9,8. What's a quarter times 9,8? <laughs> Come on. Okay, good. You've got a number. That's the force that's exerted on the duster. Okay, about 2.5 newtons. So what's the force that's exerted on the earth? 2.5 newtons. If you divide this by the mass of the earth, how much acceleration do you think you get? Very small. So when I drop the duster, is everyone happy I can assume the earth doesn't move? That's the same assumption here. You see the dust is interacting with the earth, but the earth isn't changing very much. I can always just say the earth stays the same. Now that's just an approximation. You see? Uh, excuse me. Yes. Now, the, with respect to um, a person, uh, assumption here, the issue of the earth and the dust of the earth is very massive. So we see that that uh, uh, acceleration of the earth is close to zero mm -hmm. or but unlike this case, where we have uh, the particles, the masses, comparing those masses, the probe and the soul. Now, that's a different scenario. Okay, if the, ma if, the, if the masses of the particles in the source and in the probe are comparable, this approximation will break down. So what I always have in the back of my mind is that the particles setting up the charge are much heavier than the probe particle. So in this situation again, I'm going to imagine that these are much heavier. It's much more difficult to move these than it is to move my probe. Okay? So That's the assumption I'm making. Yes? That will have a physical limitation in terms of our experiment. In terms of our description? Oh, absolutely we will. And it need not even be uh, that the charged particles themselves are so much heavier. For example, you know with the tape, the charge that sits on the surface of the tape simply cannot move. It's attached to the surface of the tape. It's maybe an atom that has lost an electron. So instead of being the mass of the electron that's relevant, it's the mass of that whole atom. So if we were to probe that charged tape with an electron, this approximation would be good. Okay? Now, if you... So, so let me finish the thought about gravity, and it will make a link to the kinds of questions that you were asking. And then we'll talk about whether this holds and how we should relax it. So, what's going on here is specifically that, you know, if you've got the Earth and you drop a tennis ball, the Earth accelerates up slightly, but ever so slightly. So in this situation, let's say this is a ball. Everyone agrees we don't have to worry about the motion of the Earth, right? What if we took the Earth and we dropped a truck? You know, one of these big 10 ton trucks, that's much heavier. Do we have to worry about the motion of the Earth? No. What happens if we take the Earth and just somehow we manage to find another planet? That's the same size as the Earth. Let's call that P. Now we'll drop this planet towards the Earth. Do we have to worry about the movement of the Earth? Yes. So it's got to do with how easy it is to move this thing compared to how easy it is to move this thing, right? When this thing moves, now the Earth will also move. 
And this is, in fact, exactly the point that your colleague was worried about. He's saying, but we're studying the situation where it's just as easy to move the source as it is to move the probe. We are always assuming here that, in fact, it's always more difficult to move the particles in the source than it is to move the probe around. So again, it's tough to move these around. And that's an assumption that we're making. Now, why are we making that assumption? First of all, we'll be able to develop the theory without any obstacles. And at the end of the day, you'll be able to use the same theory when this approximation doesn't hold, just that the equations that you have to solve are more difficult. So we're doing this because it doesn't affect the development of the theory at all, but it gives us simpler equations to solve. If you want to relax this assumption, then what you need to do is not just track the motion of one particle, but track the motion of n plus 1 particles. If you track the motion of n plus 1 particles, you're not going to be able to do that analytically. You'll usually write a computer program to solve those equations numerically. In the first problem that you solve, you will have a situation where there will be a collection of particles moving around. So you'll see an example of where you have to do that, where the particles in the source are moving around and the particles that you call your probe is moving around as well. Okay? So this is an assumption that will not always hold. We're assuming it for simplicity and because it is not going to affect the development of our theory. So, not always a good approximation. Um, it's assumed for simplicity um, and won't restrict. So it won't restrict, it won't uh, you know, limit in any way. It won't restrict or limit. the final theory. Good. So those are two of the assumptions that we've got. Superposition principle and no back reaction. Those two assumptions we will keep in place for the entire course. We'll never relax those two assumptions. I'm now going to put forward one more assumption that we are going to relax at some point. So, now we are going to assume the particles in the source are at rest. Okay. So that means, if you look at all of these different positions, dx1 dt is 0, dx2 dt is 0, all the way up to dxn dt is 0. That's just an assumption that we're making for simplicity. Okay, so we make this assumption for simplicity. And this will lead us to electrostatics. So when we want to start studying magnetostatics, we'll allow the particles to move with a constant velocity. And then when we want to study electrodynamics, the particles can have any motion at all. Uh, there can even be accelerations in the game. Okay. So those are the three assumptions that we're going to make. That's the basic question and the three assumptions we're going to make. Are there any questions or comments that anyone would like to make at this point? Yeah. Yep. Uh, our last assumption 
when we have the x, the t, the z, z, I mean, we are assuming, we are assuming that they are array. Good. Now, what are the case that the, the x and the t will still be zero and it is not at rest? Well, if the, okay, if the x, the t is zero, that means that x is not changing with time. Do you agree? Yes. So that means the particle must be at rest. You have to. No. So, so here, moving at constant velocity would mean the x, t, t would be a constant. But if the x, t, t is zero, that really means they're at rest. Okay? So when we come to magnetostatics, we'll only require the acceleration is zero. And that will mean that we'll also have constant velocities. But yeah, really requiring that the velocity is zero. Good? Yep. Um, in respect to the large mass and the small mass, could we look at it in terms of reference planes where the, the large mass was a fixed reference frame and the, the other particle was maybe that's the way of bring it in respect to a fixed reference Okay, frame. good. So, uh, I've, so let me rephrase your question and tell me if I've got it. Okay. What you're saying is, if we just have a collection of particles, yes. I can always move into the reference frame of the heavy particle. Yes. And with respect to that reference frame, the heavy particle is fixed and only the light particle is moving. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Good. Fine, we can do that. But you must remember that the laws of physics only hold in an inertial reference frame. So if that heavy mass is moving around a little bit, then the frame in which that heavy mass is fixed is not an inertial reference frame. And you're not allowed to use Newton's second law, you're not allowed to use Coulomb's law, or anything like that. So it's, it's, it's not just that our heavy, it's not just that our heavy mass is at rest, but it must be at rest in an inertial reference frame. So I really need it to be heavy and not moving around when that little guy is, is coming close or going further away. Yeah, but good question. In fact, that logic, if you, if you, if you deal with two particles, that logic leads you to the so-called center of mass and relative particle formalism. And that's a very beautiful way of solving that problem. Anything else? Marcus? There's, okay, so we're assuming that, that all the, the source particles are standing still. What about the protoparticle? Oh, it can do what it likes. So you see, in this situation, we still get a non-trivial dynamics for the probe. So the source is completely fixed, but you know, the probe might you know, do whatever it likes. And it's that motion of the probe that we're actually interested in. By figuring out what force is acting on the probe, we would, if we liked, if, uh, we could sit down with the computer, solve Newton's second law now that we have the force, and figure out how that probe particle would move. Okay. One more thing. You, mm -hmm. So you have the position of the probe particle as a function of time. So if the force was dependent on the relative velocity, that would also be able to, you'd be able to measure that because you have the motion. Okay, so in this situation where all the particles are at rest, what we're going to find out is all of the forces are time independent. When we allow velocities into the game, then we'll get other interesting effects that we'll actually discuss. Yeah. Okay? Just, okay, maybe I'm not clear about this, but there's a difference between saying that your velocities are all zero and saying that your forces don't depend on velocity. That's true. In general, there's a difference. In electrostatics, once you fix the particles, okay, once you fix the particles to be at rest, you only get electric fields. As soon as you allow your particles to move, there are magnetic fields in the game, and forces due to magnetic fields depend on velocities. So, so, so I'm not trying to make a general statement, but for electromagnetism, if your particles are at rest, none of the forces depend on velocities. Yeah. If the particles in your source are at rest.